coming from because I really don't like to use a microphone. I like to because I like to talk to you, not at you, and uh, discuss some of the things that you want to hear. Um, I'm Keone Young, uh, and we have different. I I don't know. Uh, I have a long career, and it's a career full of different genres. So. Um, Every time I go to a con, I have to suss out, like, is that a G.I. Joe guy? Is that a uh, Star Wars Rebels guy? Is that a Men in Black person? Uh, and so on and so on. Or is it a, a, a Jake and the American Dragon? Jake the American Dragon. American Dragon. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, I, I am not particular, though I've done a lot of voice acting, or G.I. Joe, yeah, Storm Shadow. Uh, Though I've done a lot of voice acting, my main thrust was to perform, was I wanted to be a performer. And uh, I just felt like, well, I didn't want to work for a living. In other words, work for somebody. I wanted to enjoy my life and try and find a path for me to, that I could do the things that I wanted to do. Not somebody telling me what I should do. And I f fell in love with acting. For one, it was a collective art form. And it, it took a lot of hard work working, but you could work alongside people, with people. I wanted to be, first I wanted to be a technician. I wanted to work lighting. I wanted to work design. I wanted to work on the sets. And, uh, I realized all these other actors didn't want to do small parts. They only wanted to do the big parts. And so I said, I'll do all the small parts. I did all the waiters that would come in and bring you coffee, take your order. Uh, the bus boy that would collect all the plates in the scene. I would come in and uh, be the bell boy, bring your luggage up to your room. And then finally I would realize you know what, these actors, they're not that as good as they think they are. <laughs> and so um, I built myself up doing American stage and I, I worked in all the classics and, I, and luckily I had mentors along the way. People would tell me, hey, you should read, you should read this play, you should read these books, you should read the, you know, uh, watch these movies. And I got engrossed and I got committed to it. And, uh, yeah, you know, there's two type of voice acting. How many people are more into, like, animation and cartoons and movies? There, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of people ask me, okay, how do I, how is voice acting? How, what kind of uh, form is it? And for me, it's always been two types. One is the guy who can copy or recreate any sound in this world. Like if you know Frank Welker, you know Frank Welker? Mm -hmm. Frank Welker was my mentor and he was a giant. And I wanted to become a, an actor and I went into a room with him and they said, Frank, we have a rocking chair in this. We didn't record the sound of it. Can you recreate the sound of rocking chair squeaking? And he said, well, is it wood? Is it metal? Is it an antique? How heavy is it? And he gave you eight different sounds of that rocking chair. And then once he, they said, Frank, we have a stone that falls, you know, and it falls into the, and he goes, well, how heavy is it? What does it fall into? What is the stone made of? And he would give you 10 different versions of a stone. I said, okay, that's not me. I'm not that, I, I better get out of here. But I was told by somebody, but you know what? Uh, people, people can re 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 recreate things and copy things, but nobody can do you better than you. And so I went with that other part of acting, which is building up myself and building up my own resources for my own past, my father, my grandfather, my uncles, and the community that I grew up in. And I was very fortunate and that's the two type of actors, one that can do, that have skills 
and one that has heart mm -hmm. or character. And that was my forte. And that, which leads me to G.I. Joe, which I was very fortunate to be part of. Because in G.I. Joe, if you, re if you remember, and if you were from that period, all we had was Hanna-Barbera in those days. And it was, uh, and uh, Yogi Bear. And it was kind of like an extension of kind of like stereotype sounds that we would like to hear, oh baby, you know, you know, like the kind of baby talk that we do. But then G.I. Joe brought about like humanity and relationships and diversity. And that was what was exciting. You saw people like yourself in heroic roles instead of these super characters that, or animals that, yeah, they were fun, and they're fun to laugh at, but they had nothing to do with you in real life, but G.I. Joe did. And it, you have to understand that at that period, our society was in a great conflict. You know, it was during the 60s, uh, pre-60s, it, it was led up from the 60s, the struggles of the 60s, the 70s. And they wanted to make G.I. Joe more responsive to society. And that was what I found interesting. You know, you had Spirit, who was American Indian. You had Storm Shadow, who was Asian. You know, and you had Roadblock. He's a black guy. And so you had a diverse group of people working together, and that was very interesting for me at that point. Because I was the kind of actor I was. You know, I wanted to attack issues and be part of something meaningful. And uh, you'd be surprised, a lot of people come up to me who are middle aged and they go, You were my memories. <laughs> I learned a lot. If it wasn't for you, I would have been a, you know, a hoodlum. And uh, so that was a, that was kind of trend that was starting, you know, in terms of films and in terms of movies and in terms of TV. It started to go. It had some kind of social conscious, which for me was really important in terms of creativity. Uh, I hope you guys are following me. But anyway, uh, so. I learned that nobody could be better than me but me, but yet I was like not experienced. So I went out and got life experience, which is what everybody has. But in order to perform, in order to convey character and stuff, you need a lot more life experience. You need to go out and uh, challenge yourself. You need to learn. So. That's me. Uh, has anybody seen Deadwood? You have seen Deadwood. So you know what this means, Hang Dai. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hang Dai. Uh, it, it was, what I wanted to do in Deadwood was like convey my, my parents and my grandparents' story, which was very important to me. My family's history in America. And uh, so I utilized a lot of that. And, uh, I went back and I learned my own culture. I learned how to speak my languages. I learned how to write. I learned the, the dances. I learned our foods, even, you know? So acting is not just emoting, but acting is learning about all the different things that you want to convey. Any questions so far? <laughs> yeah? Uh, do you know why the animation in American Dragon changed for the second one? Because that's one thing that's always bothered me. In corporate world, mm -hmm. a lot of things bother me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> why do they do certain things? Why, do you, why did you kill that character? Mm -hmm. Why did you? He, I loved him, you know? No telling. Some guy is in the back room going like, you know, I don't like that color. Mm -hmm. Let's change it. Or let's go to Korea and do it because they do it cheaper. <laughs> so, but any other questions, particularly about what I said or what? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering how, um, as someone who's obviously very invested in character, how do you overcome um, where the writing may, I guess, um, 
believe in stereotypes. Uh, yeah, it's know. rough. That's a rough one. Because usually the writers are people who are not really as experienced in life. And so sometimes you as the actor have to go in and teach them how to do it, what you really want to convey. Because writers, are, are, they don't want to convey stereotypes. They start from that. But then you go in and you say, you know, let me try this, let me try that. I don't know if you know Deadwood, that scene where I cut my hair. Well, if you think about it, all Chinese men in this country at one period had to wear a queue. It was a law. It was a rule. By the, you could never go back to China if you didn't have it. So, the Chinese who came here, who built the railroad, who did the laundry, and who opened the restaurants, realized, you know what? We're going to stay in America and become Americans. Forget it. And they did that. They cut off their cues. So I wanted to convey that. And the writer said, you know, that's a great idea. So you have to trust yourself, number one, and have self-confidence. Unfortunately, a lot of actors try and serve. Like, you know, your boss. You, you try and do what you think they want you to do. But you always have to have the confidence and self-confidence to know yourself. And that's what I mean about you're the only person that can do you better than you. Nobody can do you. You can do you. So as long as you have that self-confidence, you can go up to your boss and say, you know what? I know you think this, but what about this? So that's how I've dealt with it. Unfortunately, a great amount of time, nobody, a, a great amount of time, people aren't that open and they think they know better than you even though they don't, and you piss them off, and you never work for them again, until they need you, until they need you, then they gotta come back to you. Does so you have, have uh, uh, like, Have you found that that attitude has been changing over the years, or like, like has there been a big difference where that becomes more open, or is it kind of still as it was? Look at TV today. All the women have to be beautiful. It's like, where do they hang out? <laughs> where do these women hang out? I never see them, you know? But all of a sudden you have this kind of male concept of what, you know, a female lead should be. And it's like, it's sad because, you know, I'm a senior citizen now and I've seen a lot of actors who got older become not, not used because of that, because people have that concept that people want to see young, beautiful people. No, people want to see real good stories, you know, that mean something to them. But, you know, so we're always in conflict with that. We're always challenging that. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about, you've gone to many conventions and shows over the years what yeah. your experience here at Stockton Punk been like for you uh, what has separated it from other shows that you've done and uh, spoke at okay let me tell you why does somebody want to come to the con I, I, I'm not too quite clear about that but I know in the different regions there's some people know why they want to come to a con because they know they're interested in their, in their particular genre, let's say. And they are kind of like, they're very hip to it. There's some areas where people still aren't really clear about, like, you know that guy was talking about, he couldn't talk to some people about Star Wars, sure. you know. But I would like to see places like this where you can educate people more about the art form, let's say. And I don't consider myself an artist, you know, I don't like to say I'm an artist, you know. I work in the industry. But the art form itself, because when people learn about the art form, they become more appreciative of Star Wars than they just be a fan type of thing. You know, they become more appreciative of the concept of what 
characters are doing and what characters are saying. And that more, puts more pressure on us because audience will say, no, I don't believe you. I don't believe you would do that. I don't believe that character. And it would make me say, okay, I got to be believable. I got to work harder. You know what I mean? So cons can really help educate people in terms of, uh, in terms of responsibility of a story. You know, I don't know how you feel about that. Thank you. Huh? Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I like, I love it when people come up to me and go, you know, the history of the character, I don't quite agree with. <laughs> you know, for this reason, that reason, this reason. You know, it's really interesting. Well, if you could just come up to me and go, oh, I loved you. <laughs> well, if you love me, Take me home. <laughs> yeah? Uh, Mr. Young, um, you're, uh, I believe you're one of the pioneers in Amer Asian American theater, and you're, uh, you're still a member of the East West Players? Well, I'm no longer a member because they've become co commercially very, you know, very commercial. But I did, I, I did. I wanted to develop a voice for us. You know, my voice, my people's voice. You know, because when I came here, I didn't speak like this. I had to learn how to speak like this, you know. I spoke in my own native patois, which, which people used to make fun of. If you ever been to Hawaii, yeah. you know, you okay. know that people speak what we call pidgin English. So, instead of having to learn and train all my life to speak in a classical standard stage speech, I wanted to speak like how my grandfather talked. Hey, you go over there and then bye bye, you come back. <laughs> you know, I wanted to tell that story, which in Deadwood I hope I did with my character. And I always try and do that, you know. And people say, uh, you know, why do you do that, man? Because, you know, you make us like with accents. Well, I was born with an accent. And we all are. If you really learn about yourself, if you really listen to yourself, you go home and listen to your parents, they all got accents. You know, but at one time in my life, we were made shame to be what we were and were made to aspire to fulfill some kind of role. And that always seemed contradictory to me. And as an actor, I always wanted to portray my people. I didn't want to be Richard Burton, <laughs> to be or not to be. And believe me, we, that's all we did. You know, it's all we did. We tried to imitate, you know, great actors. I wanted to tell stories about my dad and my mom, you know, and I want that to be as relevant as Shakespeare's. So yes, I was involved in developing, you know, our stories. We have time for about one more question. Well, any, you, anything, ask me about any silly thing you want. I mean, I don't care about the industry, about, yeah? Uh, can you tell us some, we've got, like, we've got Deep Space Nine. Working on Deep Space Nine? Yeah. D-Space Nine was great. D-Space Nine was, I think they tried to break away there and tell, again, stories that related to people. If you remember, I mean, Cisco was a, a, was a black guy, right? He was an African American. That was really cool. And he was a lead of the show. You had, um, you, you had one character that was uh, an Arab, right? Huh? Yes. Right? Yep. And so it, 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 you got to entertain different con concepts and as well as aliens, you know, which kind of represented all kinds of people in our society today. Yeah, Deep Space Nine was a very, very wonderful experience for me. Um, anything else? Anything about animation or why are you guys fans? Or are you guy fans? Yeah, come on over here. Huh? Yeah, come on. Well, it's a question I, I ask uh, of uh, voice actors. Who is your Mount Rushmore? You know what? I'll tell you. You can't underestimate these guys. These guys are, you know, I've worked with a lot of people. I've worked with Pacino, Chris Walken, Alan Alda, 
who are, who's I think one of the greatest act, American actors we are. I work with Billy Wilder, I work with Francis Coppola. But I tell you, voice actors are on par with these people. Now I came up the period of uh, Dawes Butler, Frank Welker, uh, and, uh, and uh, no, B.J. Blank. Ward, you know, uh, great actors. But then I worked alongside of other great actors who were like Frank, uh, uh, well, Frank Walker, but uh, Rob Paulson, who was one of the t original Turtles, and Corey Burton, uh, who's a great voice actor. These, I worked, that's my generation. But then came along these other guys like Dee Bradley Baker, in, in, in the younger generation. And then now you have this kid called Eric ba Bowser, who's like, he did Puss in Boots, he does Daffy Duck, he does Marvin the Martian. I mean, the guy is phenomenal. So every generation, every 10 years, there's some guy that comes along, or woman that comes along, like Gray Delisle, and just blows you away. It's like, uh, I should quit now, <laughs> you know? So. I mean, continuously, the industry, like technology, is excelling. It's getting better and better and better. And if you want to be a voice actor, you better get your chops done. Mm -hmm. You know, because these guys are good. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to end it there uh, for thank, time. Thank you for all coming. And I hope that I said one thing that would enlighten your day. Uh, we are, love our fans. We love and need fan support. And that's why we exist. So I want you to think about that. I appreciate you guys very much for coming to a con. And that's why I come. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The will be up on the fun deck for the rest of the afternoon. You can go up there and have a chat, get a photo, get an autograph, come say hello. We'll be setting up for the Geek Fest.